Praise the Lord. You reach Pastor Priscilla Hall. Let us go to his gracious throne of grace and petition him. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, we rejoice. We rejoice forevermore in the very knowledge of who you are. We give thanks in all things, obeying your will and acknowledging and accepting our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the impartation of your Holy Spirit that has proven itself to be excellent. Spirit that can keep, convict, instruct, reveal, make known all that you declare to be manifested. Father, we thank you because your kingdom has been built on your authority and your wisdom that is impenetrable. It cannot fail. You have given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. You've even given us the armor of God that when properly applied in faith and executed, trusting in you. Every element is significant to guard against the wiles of the adversary. The wicked and evil days you said shall come. Fret not yourself against workers of iniquity so they will soon be cut down. And so Father, we thank you that we can truly trust you. We thank you because we're not going to quench the spirit. We're going to let your Holy Spirit rule and reign and have his primacy over our life. We thank your heavenly father because there's nothing you can't know or do. You can work out all things according to your will that it would be good and acceptable and your perfect will because of the power that you behold. Father, we honor you just for you being God all by yourself. It's a privilege and an honor to know we have a holy and righteous God that will never leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' name, we pray and we give you the glory because you are the I am. You're the wonderful counsel, the Prince of Peace, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. You're the Holy One, the fortress, the rod, the shield, the staff. You're the bread of life. You're the living water. Ah, yes, God. And we honor you. We thank you. Oh, it's just so, so, so satisfying that we have a God that's faithful, pure and true, holy and just, righteous and honorable, a good report and praiseworthy. Hmm. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. We desire to live and move and have our very being within you. Mm, you're the lifter of our heads. You are uprising and our downside. You are provider, our provision, our perfection. -la 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 -la. And our future glorification. And so we honor you, God. Yes. Feed us from heaven. Let us partake of your manna from heaven. For we cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded forth from you. We honor you, most holy and righteous one, that truly knows all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. There is something about trusting in the holy righteousness of God that no matter what you may be going through or not going through, he has a way of giving you knowledge and understanding not to worry, nor be anxious for nothing, but through prayer and supplications with thanksgiving to make your request known in the God of peace that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind and to the day of his return. See, he guards your heart and your mind so that it will be in the perfect will of God so that when you go to the throne, whatever you ask in his name, According to his will, he hears you. And if he hears you, you know you have the petitions of your desire because your heart and your mind is in alignment with the holy and righteous God. That's why God says, have a mind of Christ because your thoughts are not higher than his thoughts and your ways are not higher than his ways. And so as the heaven is higher than the earth, so is his thoughts and his ways. <laughs> oh, that's the blessing of who God is. We have to see God as being great. We have to see God as being excellent. We have to see God as being omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. An incommunicable attribute we will never be able to possess fully. We can never be omnipresent. We can never be omniscient and we can never be omnipotent. That and that alone should keep you on your knees to receive from the most holy wise one of creation. Now let us go to the word of God so that we may rest our assurance on a greater foundation of the one who can and who is worthy of all things. I'm going to be looking at the various transportations in the biblical time. My previous sermon was on temple, church, scholarly school, and houses. And this sermon is going to be addressing transportation during the biblical times. And there were quite different modern methods that were used. Many are familiar with the walking. That was the most common mode of transportation. Many journeyed, including pilgrimages and daily travel were undertaken on foot. We know that to be true because many who entered the homes, hospitality will wash the feet of those who entered into their home because they traveled on foot. And they will remove their sandals and wash their feet as a sign of hospitality. Because their feet would be so dirty from the sand and the environment in which they traveled. And they would be tired. So it would be a, a sign of hospitality and accepting you and then comforting you for your weary feet, washing and cleansing your feet. Now, That was just a sign of hospitality. That was a tradition that many did when you entered into their homes. Not just for cleansingness, because of the travel that you did on foot, but also as a token of showing caring. Jesus and his disciple often traveled by foot, as seen in passages like John 4, 6, where Jesus rests by Jacob's well during a journey. 
The Israelites traveled on foot during their exodus from Egypt, Exodus 12, 31. We also have animals. They also used animals. Not only did they walk, but they also rode on animals, such as donkeys and mules. These animals were commonly used for riding and carrying loads. Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem on a donkey, Luke 2, 4 through 5. There were camels. Camels were used especially for long distance travel and in desert regions. For example, the journey of the wise men to visit Jesus is often depicted with camels, Matthew 2, 1 through 12. They also use horses. Although less common for everyday use, horses were used in war and by wealthy individuals. King Solomon had horses and chariots, 1 Kings 10, 26. Chariots were used in warfare ceremonies and by royalty and military leaders. The Egyptians' army pursued the Israelites with chariots during the Exodus, Exodus 14, 6 through 7. They also used boats and ships. Water travel was significant, especially for trading and fishing. The Sea of Galilee and the Mediterranean Sea were common settings for such travel. Jesus traveled with his disciples by boat across the Sea of Galilee, Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Paul's missionary journey involved extensive sea travel, as seen in Acts 27, which details his shipwreck. Carts and wagons used for transporting goods and people, especially over longer distances and for heavier loads. The Ark of the Covenant was transported on a new cart, 1 Samuel 6 through 7. In summary, Transportation in biblical times was largely dependent on walking and the use of animals. With chariots and boats playing significant roles and specific contexts. The Bible provides numerous accounts of these modes of transportation reflecting the lifestyle and technology of those in ancient times. Now we use cars. and airplanes and trains. So you can see how transportation has evolved. Psalms 27 goes as this, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. This verse contrasts the reliance on military strength and human power, symbolized by chariots and horses. Materialistic possessions were often displayed and utilized to personify wealth and power. And many would put their faith and trust and their material possessions as opposed to God, not by might, not by power, but by my strength, my spirit, says the Lord. Anytime we put our confidence, our faith and trust and what we can acquire that is temporary, that loses value, that's made by human hands, that's designed for various usage over the spirit of God. We have misplaced faith and trust. In the context of ancient Israel, chariots and horses represented formidable military technology and power. 
Nations would often place their confidence in their military capabilities for protection and victory and battles. It's almost of how we put our faith and trust in technology and computers and cell phones. And every other element, TV, alarm systems, cars, boats, houses, buildings, positions and titles, people, institutions. While they all can have proper usage to enhance the working that is necessary to complete a task or get to a specific location, airplanes, quickly. We are not to put our faith and trust in those materialistic items. While they're nice to have for luxury, for relaxation, for financial gain, assets, for bartering, for trading, for a portfolio. We cannot put our faith and trust in those things. For they will one day fail you. We can't even put our faith and trust in these earthly vessels. For they will one day fail us. And we don't know the day nor the time. How can I put it this way? There were many who worked on a building project to build churches. But once the church was completed and received its certificate of occupancy, many failed to occupy the church building. There could have been a church split, a church separation, and new people arrived on the scene. And those who labored and built the church never had the satisfaction of serving in the building. New people could have came and took it over, not knowing the history, the sacrifice that was done. Not knowing the labor, laboriously, commitment that was made. Not knowing the tension, strife that was a carry. Not knowing the lawsuits behind the dissatisfaction of the workmanship, not knowing the payout of invoices that was required, not knowing paid staff versus volunteer staff, not knowing the workings and selection and responsibility of those required to serve. 
We cannot put our faith and trust in things and in people. For people will labor with you and then labor against you. For people will come together to become an adversary to accomplish a specific goal and then separate after they think they have accomplished something. We know that to be true in Joshua 9, where the Hittites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, the Gibbonites, and all came together to take from the Israelites. Because they heard about the people of God. Their wonderful exploits. Their God that provides and protects. Their God that orchestrates military might that prevails. Their God that can win wars when all they're doing is worshiping God. Their God that tells them when to fast and pray and when to march around a building seven times and shout. And the walls come falling down. The Jericho wall. They heard about the wandering and the desert for 40 years and how God provided manna from heaven. They heard that the shoes and clothes never wore out and that there was a serpent made that they could look to and they would not be die. They would not die all who were bitten by the serpent. They heard how Moses hit the rock and the water flowed through. They heard how they were led by night with fire. And in the day with the sun, they heard about the great I am, that they were now peculiar people, a holy nation, a royal people, that God would be their God and that he would fight their battles. They saw the provisions that God had given them, the land of Canaan. And the inhabitants that were supposed to never remain so that there will be no defilement overflowing into the lives of the Israelites. And yet, they tried to deceive God's people to befriend them. In deception to take. You cannot take anything from God's people except God releases it. Because if you do, there are consequences. Repercussions you will not be able to come up against and withstand. The Philistines took the Ark of Covenant. We know that in Samuel. And a play came about. And they returned it. The Israelites didn't even have to go get it. The Philistines returned it. Anything you take that God releases, because God could have killed everyone who touched the Ark of the Covenant that was not authorized to touch it, the Philistines. But he's incomprehensible in the way that he disciplines those that are against him. We don't always understand the how, the when, but he keeps his word. He disciplines. He brings judgment against the righteous and the unrighteous. And they're rewarded for their actions whether it be 
unjust or just. We know that to be true. When the Egyptians came after the Israelites. And arrogancy. God departed the Red Sea. Showing he's the God of creation. He can even control a sea that he created. Something they had never seen or even heard of or even imagined. They had all their chariots and all their horses and all their shields and helmets and swords. And the Israelites are traveling with much that God made them give, the Egyptians give. God will take from the unrighteous and give to the righteous. He'll store up the unrighteous mammon and justify his transference to the righteous. He's God. We don't always know how God is going to operate because he's incomprehensible. But we do know that God is a righteous and holy God and that we have been made in his image. So if we're made in his image, we're not cats and dogs. That's beneath the image of God. That's why the Bible says, have on the mind of Christ so you don't debase yourself and to which is low. And you think you're high. That's why we are to possess the characteristic, the communable attributes that God puts within these earthly vessels. Because we can't physically look like God, but we can have some of his attributes that demonstrates we are his. His attributes are not evil and wickedness. His attributes are long suffering. Even when we get agitated and unbecoming because we're human, we get tired we get frustrated. We become doubtful. But there is no excuse when there's a throne open eternally that we can access 24-7 that will literally change the very essence of our inner being to be able to handle what we're dealing with. He can take your worst situation and somehow, some way, console you that is no longer a devastation to you. It's a reality that God is able, despite all situations. Mm -hmm. And so, while many trust in their military technology powers, in their titles and positions, in, a, in, in the facade of money and wealth, God still, even today, for he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore shows through his infinite wisdom that he is the only confidence. He is the only sure foundation. He is the only true riches in heaven. He is the only great I am. He is the only principalities and powers that will stand forever. Nations would often place their confidence 
in their military capabilities for protection and victory and battles. And yet we saw through scripture, Jerusalem, a very well walled city be destroyed by the Babylonians. Something that Jerusalem inhabitants had become so complacent that they forgot the very God that protected them despite of the walls that he gave them the mind to design and put up. We can never take what we do from humanity and think that it's be full protection without the unseen workings of God. We can purchase houses and put all elaborate security systems in them. We can monitor our home on our cell phones and monitor our homes on our computers. We can monitor our homes on our television screens and we can monitor our homes in a multiplicity of places. But except God oversees the protection, one day, somewhere, those alarms will be penetrated. We can have all the wealth in the world, the greatest portfolio. We can own Wall Street. We can have brilliant minds to trade and perceive in advance what stocks will increase drastically. But except God be your financial portfolio, one day, somewhere, there's going to be a stock market crash. We can design the most wealthiest secured vehicle. And I do like the cyber Jeep, the cyber car. I just like the style of it. It's different. And I think I would like to have one in white. Or maybe black or gray. I like the design of it. Very unique. And we can have one of those hundred something thousand dollar cars. I don't think I like electric. I'm not one that easily like to change from what I'm comfortable to. But I'm sure electric would have its time. And we could have one. And it could be so secure, bulletproof. The tires could be bulletproof. But somewhere, somehow, it's going to fail you. At one time or another. Maybe because it's a cyber car or a cyber truck, whatever you call it, somebody may be able to tap in and manipulate its GPS. And it takes you off the roadway into an abyss. We never know when evil shall penetrate what we put our confidence in over God. That's why we are warned to remain fully clothed and keep our confidence in him, the Lord. So if something should happen, we have a Father of mercies and the God of all comforts, that even in the most devastating moment of your life, he is able to carry you through. And I did say carry you through. The psalmist emphasized the true security and victory that it comes from God. 
And until we accept that it comes from God, we have a false sense of security, a false sense of wealth, a false sense of accomplishments, a false sense of ability, and a false sense of who God is. One that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask of or think according to the power that worketh within. This is not human might. We can have brilliant minds, and the Bible said in Genesis, we had brilliant minds. They were coming together collectively on one accord to build the Tower of Babel. And the brilliant mind had designed architecturally how to construct a building to get to heaven. Now, no one had shown them. They were not duplicating. They were creating. They had never seen the structure. They were designing it in their imagination. And God saw that what they were doing was disobedient in his sight. So he humbled them, confounded their ability to communicate and disperse them so they could not complete the task at hand. We have brilliant minds because we've been created in the image of God. And the only time our brilliancy see profits in the kingdom is when it's according to the will of God. So all of the creation that humanity has been able to complete while here on earth with his brilliancy. Some has been used to glorify God and some have been used for wickedness and evil. For whatever has been created, it is the one who uses the product that determines whether it be used for good or evil. A problem that always existed from the very beginning of creation. The knowledge of good and evil. While we have great technological devices, for evil you can be tracked by every keystroke you key, by every location you go, by every purchase you make. And many databases can be manipulated. We cannot put our faith and trust in information that can be manipulated, information that can be hacked. Alarm systems, they can be hacked. Computer systems, they can be hacked. Our new technological advance Cars, they can be hacked. Our cell phones, they can be hacked. Our security cameras, they can be hacked. And you can be tracked every place of your life. We're losing much and much of our privacy. And I know if we're not doing anything wrong, we should have nothing to worry about. But the reality is, I like my privacy. And I don't like my privacy being interrupted by those who have wrong intentions.
Even God had private moments. Even Jesus had private moments. He went to the garden of Gethsemane, told his disciples, wait here, I'm going to pray. And it's important that we have our private moments. And why I love all the advancements when used in the wrong hands, it does not glorify God and it becomes wicked and evil usage. And anything that's wicked and evil usage is a debasement, not an exhortation. For righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. We have technology that can write all of your dissertations, do all of your research, call up all of your sermon notes, can even write a sermon for you, can write a resume for you, can show you how to learn anything that your mind can conceive. And while that can all be used for good, to enhance the depth of the knowledge and understanding of the human mind towards information, if used the wrong way, it can become very detrimental. Computers are good when you want to access scriptures in a quick method to compare and contrast. But your message will only be glorifying to God once you get on your knees and let God determine the message for you to research. And then to impart knowledge and understanding through the scriptures. Anything that we do without seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we shall soon see the results. That will not be fully honorable to God. And so God encourages believers to place their trust in his power and his faithfulness, his dependency, his majestic, his sovereignty, his almightiness, his holiness, his I am, his omnipotent, omnipresent and omniscient rather than in any material or worldly means. Now that can be very difficult because we as human from the very beginning of creation have learned to be dependent on another. For out of the womb, we depend on someone to feed us. No one teaches a baby how to cry. They come out of the womb crying. They've never heard a cry. But they open up their mouth and begin to cry. And somehow, some way, they rationalize that if I cry, I get the attention. And that attention will satisfy why I'm crying. If I want to be held, I cry. If I want to be fed, I cry. If I'm wet and need to be changed, I cry. If I'm irritated and need to sleep, I cry. But it's never been taught. It's almost as if the baby is teaching the adult. I cry, you come. I cry, you do. I cry, you learn. 
that I'm not satisfied. There's something wrong. Isn't it amazing how God can have babes know something that they've never seen or been taught. That's God. Some are more advanced than others. They can have abilities that their parents never had. God is ensuring the entire creation that he's God. And no matter how advanced we become, we will never be wiser than the incomprehensible God of creation. That is the most humbling knowledge of acceptance that we can have towards our holy and righteous God. And that keeps us most dependent upon him for things seen and unseen. Because he can do something, reveal something, create and place within our inner beings thoughts and ways that we would have never conceived. That's who he is. For what's impossible with humanity is only made possible with God. Glory to God. Now, what we need for comfort and assurance, some of these technological inventions, alarm systems that churches have that we've never had before. But just about every church has an alarm system. Some are more elaborate than others. Just about every house has an alarm system. Some are more elaborate than others. Just about every car has an alarm system. Some are more elaborate than others. While we and all these companies have alarm systems and security, even churches have security now, even with their alarm systems. And while these devices make one feel comfortable, we cannot feel too comfortable that we forget to access the one who is the fortress that can protect all things. So we can have those technological advances, but we still must depend on the holy and righteous God that is necessary. God determines. Even as a babe grows in wisdom and understanding and stature, they learn how to manipulate. When you put them down to sleep, if they don't want to sleep, they'll do what they know to do to get you to pick them back up and don't leave them there. They don't want to sleep. They don't want to eat, no matter how much you place the bottle or a spoon into their mouth. They will turn their head and know how to close down on their lips so they will not take what you're trying to put in their mouth. Think about some of the things they learn 
that was never taught. An innate wisdom they automatically have. And then they learn how to repeat a language they hear you say. And then they learn the appropriate usage of it. And know the response they get when they first start communication. It always amazes me. And yet the Bible says, except you be born again. You cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to go back to dependency on a holy and righteous God to provide. Even though we think we're providing for ourselves. Because none of these jobs are guaranteed. Not even in a church. None of these companies are guaranteed. Not even a church. And we cannot determine which one will have the wealth. For God quite often shifts wealth according to his perfect will. And that's why it's necessary to be in alignment of the flow of the Holy Spirit. Seek him first. Those things will be added unto you. That's the God that we serve. And so we have to become humble as babes. And let him, through his spirit, the Lord, grow us in maturity and stature, dependent upon him as we are released from the dependency upon the world. And that's wisdom. And that is the greatest liberty, the greatest strength and knowledge that he is able to do all things according to his will. God never created humanity to be dependent upon humanity. The dependency was always to be upon him. And it takes a releasing and an entrance of his spirit of truth to relinquish your will, your abilities, your understanding, knowledge towards his. Not my will, but your will. It even takes an understanding of the most holy one to acknowledge we need to be kept from evil. Because if we don't desire to be kept from evil and we desire with no knowledge, we could find ourselves on the borderline of entering into evil. Except God pulls us back as he did with the high priest who had the rope around him. As he went into the holy of holy, no one could enter. And if something happened, you could use the 
castle to pull them out. The Holy Ghost snatches us out of the evil as he shines light to let us know you're entering into evil. You're devising wicked intentions and you're beginning to act upon it. That's why it's necessary to have the Holy Spirit to keep you. And then we learn how not to be triggered by the things of this world that is intentionally being devised to trigger you, to get you out of self-control. For when you're out of self-control, you can't think, can't be wise because you're not calm. That's why the Bible says, be wise as the serpent and calm as a dove. God never says anything that's not significant to our life. Anger is a good mechanism to let you know there is a problem. So he says, be angry, but sin not. So that when you become angry, it should put you on your knees. To cry out like David cried out, Lord, protect me from my enemies. Destroy them if you must do so. But I'm tired of them. And I need you to intervene. As Jeremiah cried out in lamentation, how much longer shall evil and wickedness prevail? Are you not the God of justice? Can you not destroy all? And so we can reflect on the living word as we see it operative in our lives, engaging individually with our lives. Each situation showing the wisdom and how he worked it out because you trusted him. You obeyed even when you didn't understand. You stopped some ways, even you, when you did not know those ways were hindrances. You stopped responding emotionally and you learn how to engage spiritually with the situation. You begin to seek him more. You had more patience, more long suffering. Your faith increase where many couldn't understand. Because faith is an individual interaction with just you and God. And you are compelled by what God imparted within you to continuously do what others never understood because God knows the ultimate outcome, the ultimate placement where others don't. God knew what he would do for Moses when Pharaoh didn't know. Pharaoh had plans for Moses' life, but God's plan prevailed. The people had planned for Jesus' life, but God's plans prevail. And even those close to you don't understand, will never be able to comprehend what God is doing in your life until God gets ready to reveal it. 
David's family never saw the greatness in David because they were set in the traditions and standards of the society. The first son was to receive. But God had plans for David. And so they saw what David was doing was insignificant. He wasn't pursuing military might. He was working with the sheep in the shepherd field. But God was training him in an unseen realm to battle spiritually. That's how he was able to destroy Goliath. He had no military might. A Philistine, huge in stature, mighty and strength that was feared by many. Little David stood and killed him with a slingshot. Unheard of, unimagined, but he did it. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And that's what happens when God works in your life with faith. David stood there in faith. He tried to emulate others. He put on their clothing attire, their military attire a shield, and a sword, and a helmet. It was too big. It didn't fit. And when you fight battles that God has authorized you to fight, you have to fight it in the way that God commands, orchestrate, reveals, and authorize you to do so. So David took it all. He would have lost. But the society says, if you're going to go into military battle, this is the attire you should wear. A helmet to protect the head. A shield and a vest to protect the body. A sword to do battle. But God has given us an armor, an unseen spiritual armor. And David had on an unseen spiritual armor before anybody knew the armor was available. God is always revealing. He's revealing. They never saw his armor. He was operating in faith. He was operating and he belonged to God. There was an anointing on David's life. And his sword was, you're dishonoring my God. And so God took what was in David's hands and used it for destruction. God is a destroyer. And he's forever revealing himself in mighty ways. The weapons of our warfare are not cardinal but mighty through God for the pulling down of all strongholds. And bringing everything unto obedience. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. Bless the name of the Lord. This Philistine was dishonoring the name of God. And David, a shepherd boy, 
by the power of God, by the might of God, by the spirit of God. Because it's not your power, it's not your might. It's all in his spirit. Destroy a giant. Oh, if David had not stood his ground in faith, we would have no recognition, no recording, no factual demonstration of what God can do. when he authorizes his working. Never take where God has you at for granted. David didn't complain about being in the fields with the sheep. For the Bible says he rose up early in the morning seeking God. And he found solitude with the sheep. He didn't have to worry about other people's trying to feed into him, tell him how to orchestrate his life. He was able to hear from God because sheep don't speak English. So God was communicating with David as David was among sheep. And David was learning more about God, even through the tending of sheep. Don't ever take for granted where God has you at and what he's teaching you through your environment. Because God teaches through his Holy Spirit in many ways. And sometimes we miss it. We miss spiritual warfare and how to engage in it because we're either too close to the ones who's doing it and we haven't asked God to guard our heart and our minds. We don't have the whole armor on. We're trying to do it in our might, our power, our understanding. When we need his might, his power, and his spirit. We have to be so careful of every moment that God can teach and train in many ways. And many times we take those moments and overlook them. In everything, give thanks unto God. For this is his will concerning you. He's with you, training you, informing, revealing, empowering you, showing you much. If you just seek him and be open to the movement of his spirit. David never knew that God was training him to destroy the Philistine. But God knew. He wasn't on a military base being trained by humanity. He was trained by God. Some of the greatest training you can ever receive is the one with just you and God. In an area that nobody would have ever thought you could be trained and ways that no one could ever imagine you could be trained. Trained to increase your faith. Trained to draw you into his obedience and keep your obedience to his will. Trained to keep your confidence in him. Trained to make you more dependent upon him in your entire life. 
Train to be thankful in everything because he's there and can show you how to work it out. Every opportunity is a learning experience with God. If you're seeking him for resolution and revelation. And many times we're too busy murmuring and complaining. We're too busy trying to work it out on our own. Trying to understand it, lean toward our own understanding. Trying to gather people together to orchestrate our will over a position. Trying to manipulate, deceive, beguile one another. When God is the only one that can resolve it. Oh, the faithfulness and power of God. Rather than the material and worldly possessions. We can have the worldly possessions and we can have the material as long as God is our God. And we never forget who's the more excellent. For Solomon had great wealth and material worldly possessions. In fact, he had it even when he prayed for wisdom to know how to judge, to do a job. God will never put you on a throne that he doesn't give you, equip you with everything you need to stay on that throne. I said, God doesn't. I didn't say people. But God doesn't. And when God orchestrates and deem that to be your position, if you're wise and you're seeking God for confidence and for wisdom or how to serve him, you will receive more than what you ever asked for. Because that is the God who said, I can do exceedingly and abundantly more than what you can ever ask or even think of. How did God give Solomon more than he could even ask or think of? But sometimes we receive from God, do great exports, and then later forget God. We know that to be true when Elijah had great works on Mount Carmel, and he destroyed the Baal worshippers. They're jumping and screaming and dancing, wanting fire to come down and light the altar. And Elijah just, you can put water around the altar if you want to, because you can't have fire with water. And so they put water around the altar. And Elijah just called on God. And God sent fire from heaven and lit the altar, visually showing an open spectacle to the false prophets, acknowledging that Elijah is the rightful prophet that he has selected. God can take any area in your life, any place you're at, and demonstrate his authority that you're the rightful one he has designated for a particular service. You don't ever have to worry about anybody ever obtaining anything that God has rightfully placed your name upon, not even the book of life. That's God. And the adversary wants you to spend time and strife and contention to try to get from humanity what you can only get from divinity, God's authorization, God's validation. 
And so we have to know the trickery, the fiery darts that comes against you. You have to operate in your faith and obey. Mm. And so as you trust God, you learn the superiority of reliance on him. And it takes time. It takes time. Not for all. Some takes longer. And some not long. Mm. Quietness with God is incomparable to anything you could ever do. It shows what's most important to you. It shows who you honor the most. Who you depend upon, really. Where your trust and your faith and your reliance and your strength and your wisdom and knowledge and understanding comes from. It shows who you truly belong to. Who are you fully dedicated to? And it takes you out of the necessity of being concerned about people's opinions, their will, their doing, their words, and keeps you right at the very altar of the most holy, sovereign, majestic one. Let us pray. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus, thank you for your outpouring of wisdom and knowledge about your excellency. Mm, about seeking your will. And all these things will be added. Thank you, Father, for you reveal and do time. You orchestrate all things according to your will as you uphold all things and we thank you. Whatever your will is, let it be manifested and keep us from evil. Most holy and righteous one, let us always be adorned in your doctrine. And have the garment of praise. For you are truly praiseworthy. And we should thank on those things. Keep us fully clothed in the armor. Increasing in our faith. Rooted and grounded in our obedience. and sensitive to the movement of your Holy Spirit. Most excellent one. Thank you that your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. You truly can do anything. You're not limited by location. You're not limited 
by any created being or thing or place. You are the sovereign, only wise, immortal, invisible, eternal, Lord of creation. And we honor you and reverence you for who you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Let your will be done. You design, you orchestrate, you implement, you uphold. You reveal you in Jesus' name. There is a great, great, great satisfaction in having a true intimate relationship of dependency, trust, and obedience in our holy and righteous God. Oh, I honor you. More than life itself. Mm, mm, mm. Your spirit flows through you. Mm. And no evil can come nigh. He is truly a fortress, a hiding place under the shadow of his almighty. Mm. He's that great I am. And he determines all things. Mm. I proclaim the spirit of truth through a vessel that belongs to him. <laughs> Mm. Mm. that is healthy and mind, body, and soul. Ha la 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 la